looking at some fundamental and essential rules of correct Bible interpretation. And we said we need to read the Bible through in its entirety. That gives you the overall context. Then read the individual book that's under consideration. Preferably read it in one sitting. Learn the spirit, the attitude of the book. And then we looked at ask these questions. Uh, who's the author? Uh, from a human standpoint, uh, some books we do not know, but uh, most books we do. To whom is it written? That becomes important, whether it was written to Corinth, whether it was written to the churches of Galatia, which probably was written to the churches in South Galatia. But uh, that's a good study for you. Uh, of whom was it written? Uh, for example, mentioned Galatians was written to them, or South Galatia, churches, but it was written of the Judaizing teachers and to correct their error and to prevent brethren from going astray. So of whom it is written. Then the purpose or the design of the book. Uh, you mentioned Hebrews was to prevent Jewish Christians from apostatizing. That is the whole theme of the book. Uh, amazing that some say that we can't apostatize when the entirety of the book of Hebrews is written about that one subject. Well, a lot of Galatians, that was primarily the, the situation there as well. Uh, Revelation. Uh, Christians facing persecution and the theme of the book thus is Christ will overcome, you will overcome. We, we are overcomers, we are victorious. Um, look at the historical setting. When the book was written, uh, it does make a difference. For example, uh, the book of First uh, Peter was written on the background of the Neronian persecution that was going to arise, and they were going to be suffering great persecution, fiery persecution, even. So what's the, the background, the historical setting of the book? And then when was, where was the author when he wrote the book? Uh, for example, Paul wrote Romans when he was in Corinth. And, of course, we should know a little bit of, at least about Corinth and uh, its ungodliness and worldliness. To call a person a Corinthian was to insult that person greatly because it was known for its immorality. And so uh, by saying you're a Corinthian, you're saying you are an ungodly, immoral person. So it was an insult to most people at least. Uh, you have the Roman or, or the uh, prison epistles, uh, Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. Paul wrote while he was in prison in Rome. So ask those, those questions and get an answer to them. Um, next, number three. Make an outline of the book. It is very hard to make a good outline. Um, preacher students, if they have to make an outline of a book, usually hate the, the instructor until they get out of school for a few years and then say, oh, I'm sure glad you made me do that. 
it's not an easy job. You have to know the book, and you have to read it many times. So try and make your own outline. Make it yours. I'm not saying don't reference other outlines. Most of the outlines that I have of books are partially mine and partially others. I don't mind uh, borrowing good ideas and throwing out bad ideas. Uh, we should all be willing to do that. Uh, wisdom does not begin or end with me or with any of you either. But try and make an outline of the book. It sets things in their proper perspective uh, so you don't make some mistakes otherwise in your interpretation of the book. The next point would be to, guess what, read. Does this kind of become a habit uh, as to what we're going to be saying? This time it's read the section. Read the section or the, the division of the book in which the particular subject is found. For example, If you're looking at the book of 1 Corinthians, chapters 12, 13, and 14 are dealing with a specific subject. That is the subject of spiritual gifts or miraculous powers. Those miraculous powers that would be uh, passed on to them by the laying on of the apostles' hands, and specifically Paul's hands proving that Paul was an apostle. But those three chapters, if you take them and try and use them outside of the context, you're going to misunderstand what is being discussed. Now then, if you want to go to a wider aspect of that, if you begin in chapter 11, and go through chapter 16, all of that uh, material is dealing with essentially a worship, and our, our worship to God. Uh, and yes, a lot of that would be in relationship when we come together into one place. Chapter 11 emphasizes on more than one occasion. When we come together in one place, let's take the Lord's Supper, for example. In the 14th chapter, he mentions singing. He also mentions prayer in the 14th chapter. He mentions our giving in the 16th chapter. In the, both the, four, the 14th chapter and the 15th chapter, which is the chapter on uh, the bodily resurrection, you're dealing with the preaching of the truth in that. So you're dealing in those chapters from starting in chapter 11 through chapter 16 with our worship to God. In the midst of that, chapters 12 through 14, you're dealing with miraculous gifts. Now, what's chapter 13? Chapter on love. Chapter on love is in discussion of miraculous gifts. Now you can ask yourself, now why is the chapter on love in the midst of miraculous gifts discussion? And if you wanted to, if we were teaching 1 Corinthians in that way, we'd go back to the very first chapter. There are divisions among you. Some say I'm Paul, some I have Cephas, some I have Paulus, some I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Now, you get over to the 12th chapter, and part of that was 
division came as a result of the miraculous powers that they had. And some wanting to elevate themselves above others because of the miraculous power that they had. And guess what the miraculous power that they thought was the one, the best one to have? Tongue speaking. Sound familiar in our society? Speaking in tongues. And they thought that was just the best. And they elevated themselves above the others who did not have that gift and maybe had another gift. And so, he's showing them, yes, all of these are necessary, all of them are needed. You see that in the 12th chapter. And the last verse of the 12th chapter yet says, yet show I unto you a more excellent way. A more excellent way than what? The miracles. What's that more excellent way? The way of love. And then at the end of the chapter, he shows the the permanent nature of love as opposed to the fleeting, the passing nature of miraculous gifts. And in the 14th chapter, he then corrects many of the problems that they were having in the use of those miraculous gifts. So, so the section and I say read the section, might include more than a chapter. Might include multiple chapters because that is the entirety of the section that it's dealing with or that the subject is found in. Uh, so many times what we want to do is just take out read the verse. What does it mean? I, well, I, and we start having difficulty because we haven't read, done all the reading that we need to. We haven't done the study that is necessary. We don't know those questions, and so on and so forth. So read the entire section in which it is found. And by the way, if you make a ch an outline of the book, you will then know what section it's in. Just like you could say, well, chapter 13 is on love. But it's under a subsection, which is miraculous powers, which is under a subsection of our worship. So you, in making an outline, you understand that. And you have an understanding then of those principles. Number five, guess what it is? You're right. Read. <laughs> Do some more reading. This time, read the chapter in which it's found. So after I read that entire section, I want to go back and I want to center a little bit more on the chapter that you're dealing with. Now you've already read the book at one setting, hopefully. You've read that section. Now you're reading the chapter. Doing a lot of reading, aren't you? Well, this is only the beginning point of starting to study. That's why a lot of people don't like to study the Bible. It's too hard. It's too much work. You remember the statement in St. Timothy 2.15? A what that needeth not to be ashamed? A workman. Because it takes a lot of work. So read the chapter under consideration. The next point. Should I even say it and repeat it? I mean, y'all ought to get the hang of things by now. But it is, again, read. This time, the verse or verses. 
that are under consideration. So since we're using 1 Corinthians in chapter 13, uh, if we get down to verse 8, or let me say verse 10, you want to start reading then. But it, it takes more than verse 10. It would also take verse 9 and verse 10 and, uh, in relationship to those verses that would be under consideration. And when you've read the book, the section, you've got your outline, and then you read the 13th chapter, when you get down to verses 9 and 10, you have good understanding already as to the discussion. It's going to be the cessation of those miraculous gifts of chapter 12. Something's going to come to an end. What is it? That which is in part. What is the in part? It is the miraculous gifts. What's going to remain? God's word. And love will endure But in this, always consider the verse in light of its context. I have put it a few times that context is king. By that I mean that you cannot take something out of context and be right. Even if you come to a right conclusion, you're still wrong because you've taken it out of context. But there's a lot of passages that if we would just keep in context, we'd start understanding them better. I've had, for example, people argue that Jesus went to hell. I see Tim nodding because he's probably dealt with some of those too. Uh, call upon Matthew 16 verse 18. I say unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus went to hell to establish and establish the church. Well, no he didn't. understanding of the context of that. or that here's another favorite one of the Catholics in particular Peter's the rock that the church is built upon if you go back what's the context well Jesus has brought them to Caesarea Philippi by the way knowing a little bit about Caesarea Philippi becomes important. It was a city that was literally built upon a rock. Huge boulder, if you will. Kind of like the rock of Gibraltar and uh, what it, uh, I've forgotten the city that's on that rock. Uh, but he had a, a city on the rock. And he asked his apostles, who did men say that I am? Discussion is about him. They give him an answer. Whom do you say that I am? Peter's response was, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. What's the context? Jesus and who Jesus is. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto thee, but my Father in heaven. What did the Father reveal unto him? That Jesus was the Christ, Son of the living God, who is the subject under consideration? Jesus, not Peter. And how that God had revealed that aspect of Jesus to him. Then, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, what's the rock? Who's the dis under discussion? Jesus or Peter? It's not Peter, it's Jesus. And who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God. Now we know what the rock is. That Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. And then when it gets down to the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, 
By the way, a lot of brethren misuse this passage to teach that the permanence of the church. Well, the permanence of the church is true, but this verse doesn't teach it. What this verse teaches is that he's going to die and thus go into the Hadean realm. Body will go into the grave, his spirit will go into the Hadean realm. What well, part of the Hadean realm? Part that he said, this day thou shalt be with me in, where? To the thief. In paradise. That's where he went, not to torment. But he says, that death and that the gates of Hades, literally, will not stop me from building the church. That's what he's talking about, building the church. The establishment of it. Now, you can say that since it's built upon a rock, Jesus Christ and that rock is an unfailing rock that the church might, uh, will not fail, it will not cease. But that's not what this verse is talking about. In reality, it's the establishment of it. That Satan in all of his power, all of his strength, even Hades itself will not be able to stop me from doing what I intend to do. That is to build the church. Uh, turn over to Matthew, Matthew 18 and verse 20. Another one that if we just read a little bit, we might understand it. In Matthew 18 and verse 20, states, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And how many times have you heard preachers wax an elephant about where two or three, even if it's a small number like that, two or three, Christ will be in their midst. Well, it is waxing an elephant, but it's not the truth. Now, why do I, how do I know that? Read the context. Context starts up in verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother sh shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Let me just pause here. Is that Old Testament teaching or is this New Testament teaching? Hmm. Now then, if you don't recognize that, I why I'm saying that, there are those who teach that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all Jesus was doing ex was explaining the Old Testament properly. Is telling it unto the church? Old Testament or New Testament? New Testament, of course. Well, if he neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. If he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and as a public. Verily I say unto thee, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Uh, let me just pause in relationship to that binding and loosing on earth. Literally, you could translate this, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall have already been bound and remains bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth has already been loosed and it remains loosed in heaven. They were just setting forth what God has already done. And in relationship here it is the withdrawal or treating that man as a heathen and a publican. It was, as 1 Corinthians 5 would set forth, turning that man, delivering him unto Satan. But then verse 19, again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For, and what's the for? He just set forth, here's two or three going to that individual 
to establish his sin and his error and thus his need to repent. Where two or three agree on earth regarding this matter, basically God is on your side. God is with you. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. God's with you as you're doing this. This passage is teaching about church discipline, and specifically, church discipline against an individual who has committed a personal sin against someone else, and that individual went to him, he refuses to repent, he takes one or two with him now, so you have two or three, And where those two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. If he still neglects to hear them, you tell it to the church. If he neglects to hear the church, you treat him as a withdrawn from person, a heathen and a publican. Now see, that's obvious within the context. But a lot of people pull that out of context and start talking about worship. It has absolutely nothing to do with worship. In fact, I would say that it is a gross misuse in regards to worship. Now you ask you, if I'm out by myself doing something, driving the car or whatever, and I start singing a religious song, am I worshiping? when I'm singing that religious song. If I pray and I'm all by myself, can I pray by myself? Prayer is an act of worship, is it not? Does it take two or three? Or can I pray by myself? Or do I have to go and grab somebody and say, uh, need you to hear to pray so that I can pray? Well, we know better than that. Um, and if it's two or three, can you worship with four, or five, or six, or a dozen? See, to take this as literal and apply it to worship, then those things would be sinful. Because it doesn't apply to that. It applies to the specific situation that Jesus is discussing which is discipline upon an individual. Another favorite one be found in Matthew, the seventh chapter, and verse one. Judge not, they be not judged. There's a lot of people that could not tell you anything in the Bible except that one verse. And if they happened to know another verse, it would be John 3, 16. What about the context? Have we ever considered the context of the passage? We'll just start reading. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. A mote is a little sliver, a piece of wood, as opposed to what we might say a four by four. You've got a four by four sticking out of your own eye and you go up to say, let me pull that little uh, thorn out of your eye. He's talking about a hypocritical judging. Judging that will only judge others but they won't apply things to themselves. That's context. But if you go on and he doesn't forbid judging in verse 5, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Then thou shalt see clearly to do what you're not supposed to do. <laughs> no, to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. And yet they say you can't do that. Jesus said that's what you're supposed to do. You're just supposed to.
Apply it to yourself first. In verse 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and mend you. Is he talking about literal dogs and literal swine here? The type of dogs that bark? Swine that go, how do those swine go? Oink, oink. Uh, however it is. Is that what he's talking about? Well, of course not. He's talking about certain individuals who are dogs and swine. But wait, if I'm not supposed to cast my pearls before them, doesn't that mean I have to judge whether one is a dog and swine or one or whether one is not such? There are certain individuals, he says, that's their condition. And you don't cast your swine your your pearls before them. I've got to judge in order to determine that. Let's get down a few verses. Uh, verse 15, for example. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. False prophet? Wait a minute. I can't judge whether they're a false prophet, can I? Don't I have to judge whether someone is a false prophet or a false teacher or whether they're not, whether they're teaching the truth, whether they're teaching error? And then by their fruits ye shall know them. What are the fruits? Uh, who was it that used to say um, he was a fruit inspector? Hmm? Marshall Keeble. No. A lot of times I remember the statements. I don't remember who did it, said it. <laughs> the fruit inspector. Wasn't well, that judging? Of course it is. Why? Because we have to judge. You can't take that verse 1 out of its context. If you do, you come up with the numbskull arguments of these nincompoops that have no concept as to what the Bible teaches. Always look at the context. Matthew 7, 1 does not forbid all judging. It cannot be. We have to inspect fruit. We have to judge whether someone is in sin. We have to judge whether someone is unholy or a dog and swine. We have to judge on all of those things. Uh, and by the way, I just add here. By their fruits you shall know them. That's not so much their actions that he's talking about. Now it might include their actions, but that's not what he's talking about here. What's he talking about? It's their teaching. You inspect their teaching. And that's whether someone's teaching is true, they bring forth good fruit. If their teaching is wrong, they don't. So when he's talking about a good tree, for example, verse 17, bringeth forth good fruit, the good tree that brings forth good fruit is that person who's teaching the truth. A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. In other words, if someone's teaching error, it's not going to produce what's right. But it's dealing with teaching, not their actions. And then if you look at what confirms that, when it says, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them, verse 20, what comes next? A scene of the judgment. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father in heaven. What's the difference? One is saying, Lord, Lord, but they're teaching error. The other one is doing the will of the Father. 
Many will say to me at that day, here's these are, are saying, they're teaching the truth, but they're not. They're false teachers. They will say to me at that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. What are the works? It's their teaching. Specifically here. And Jesus will profess unto them, I never knew ye, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What is their working of iniquity? It's their teaching that they are doing. Their false teaching. And that goes right back to verse 15. Keep passages in their context. Now then, let me say, would this in verses 21 through 23 have application to someone's actions? Well, of course it would. But that's not a, what is really under discussion in this, these verses. What's under discussion is verse 15, Beware false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. That's right. You got it. Takes a lot of work to, so that you can distinguish what's right and what's not right. Um, what's true and what's counterfeit. Counterfeit bills are not always easy to determine. I would ask somebody if that's correct because they passed. They received one and passed it on and found out it was counterfeit. and never look at it closely, but it was counterfeit. And took it back and got money back, but um, there's counterfeits out there. Guess what? There's counterfeit churches, there are counterfeit preachers, and some of those even are in the Lord's church. A wolf in sheep's clothing. That's right. They come in sheep's clothing. They don't. They don't come in proclaiming, "Hey, everybody, I'm a false teacher." Now they come listen to me. Well, I don't think anybody would. Have, you're not going to have anybody show up, are you? But if you come in all pious, holy, acting, very humble. And then you can start working. That's what's been done many times in many congregations. And how many congregations have been taken over by false teaching because of it. So always keep the verse in its proper context. Next, I'm just going to put here conflicts. A verse can never be and must never be interpreted so that it con conflicts with other plain emphatic passages of Scripture. Next week we'll come back to this, but I'll give one illustration for right now. When I was in college, I had a teacher. I've still got his book. Uh, of course, teachers always uh, wrote a book so that you had to buy their books. And, uh, but he came to this one section of the Bible. He gave a proper statement in relationship you are never to take a, an understanding of one of a difficult passage when there is another passage of scripture that is clear and interpretive where the difficult passage conflicts with the easy passage. And then he went right on to do that. He took a very difficult passage, is in the book of Romans, and then you have a passage over here in, actually it's 2 Peter, the third chapter, that's very clear, very distinct. And he knew that. 
and yet he took an interpretation of Romans that directly contradicted what Peter had written. He knew it, he said, it's against proper rules of interpretation, but I'm doing it anyway. That was his attitude. You cannot interpret a difficult passage where it conflicts with an easy passage. In St. Peter 3, it's pretty easy to understand that everything in this world is going to be burned up, going to melt with fervent heat. It's going to be destroyed. There's not going to be anything left of this old earth. But he took a passage in Romans and he redefined and re interpreted what Peter wrote because of that difficult passage in Romans. That's a violation of the rules of interpretation. But I say, uh, we'll start there, Lord willing, next week and continue on with our study.